In 1743, George Friedrich Handel premiered his Messiah, which was a, it's called an oratorio. It's, it's a large musical composition that was written to tell the story of Jesus Christ. Part one is about the birth of Jesus. Part two is about the life and the death and uh, resurrection of Jesus. And part three is about the coming judgment and, and the hope that we have in Christ. And part two ends with the famous Hallelujah Chorus. And even if you've never even heard of George Friedrich Handel, you've heard the Hallelujah Chorus before. And when it premiered in London in 1743, when King George II heard that Hallelujah Chorus, he was so overwhelmed by how amazing the music was and in awe of the Lord that it was praising that the king stood up in his box to, out of respect and out of admiration for the music. And of course, if the king stands up, Everybody stands up. You don't remain seated while the king is standing. And for that reason, it has now become customary for the audience to stand up during performances of the Hallelujah Chorus. So if you've ever been to a place where they did this or a church where they did this and everybody starts standing up and you're not quite sure what's going on, happened to me, that's the story. Is that when the king stood up, everybody stood up because there's just that glorious climax of Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And just like that, Romans 8 is that hallelujah chorus of Romans. It is that big climax. It's that crescendo, that building, building, building that then crashes up at the top. This, you might say, is the chapter that Paul wanted to write from the very beginning. You know, he, he had some wonderful things he wanted to say about the gospel, but in order to say them, he had to lay that long foundation of, of seven chapters. And now that we get there, chapter 8 is so much celebration of what the Lord has done. Having established and defended his gospel, laid out the truth from scripture, from sound logic, from the testimony of Christ and the law, he spends this chapter just reveling in the glory of salvation. And it's good, we have to get to that point. You can't spend your whole life just studying it. You've gotta to get to the point where you can celebrate and enjoy what God has done especially these first verses. And there are so many verses in Romans chapter 8 that you'll recognize, that you memorize when you were in Awanas or whatever it is, vacation Bible school growing up, because it, it is all comes together in this chapter. And it's not the end of the book. There's more to come. But th this is certainly, you might say, the peak of what Paul is trying to talk about. And at a time in history and in culture where so many are struggling with guilt, so many are struggling with fear. So many are struggling with depression, even in the church. Even those that claim the name of Jesus and have, have believed on him and are washed in his blood, that are dealing with the, these mental and spiritual afflictions. At, at such a time as that, we need to take the time to remember and then to celebrate what salvation really means. Not just to know it, but to know it to have that, that heart reaction and that heart celebration. I mean, just ask yourself this question, and some of you know this, and some of you are learning this. What if you could be totally free from the fear of death and totally free from the dread of daily existence? What is that worth? If you were to talk to somebody on the street and say, what would you be willing to pay to never be afraid of death and to never fear your daily life again, but just to know that everything's gonna be okay? I bet there are people that would give a lot for that very thing. Well, we've got good news, don't we? That's exactly what God has offered us in Christ Jesus. And this is when we get just to stand on grace and celebrate grace and shout grace from the top of the mountains because we as people get so bogged down in the legalism and in the make sure you're doing and you're, you're right and you're not wrong and this and that, 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 that that's inferior to what Christ has done. He's given us something so much better which is no condemnation. So why don't we read this, these first four verses? It's a short section today, and then we'll go through it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. come on, y'all, we're going to have to celebrate today. This is a good, happy passage, okay? For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh 
in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Shall we back up to verse 1 and read it again? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? None. Zero condemnation. Paul begins this chapter with a profound announcement. No condemnation. And depending on what translation you're reading, there is a, a textual note in verse 1 where the oldest, meaning King James and the New King James, add, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The, even the New King James has a footnote there that is probably not original to the text as, we, as it was passed down to us, but it is, it's in the rest of the passage, so it's not that it's wrong, it's just not that it's original. So we're not going to say any more about that, we're just going to keep going. So he's, he starts out here with, therefore. Therefore always looks back, right? And this is a different word for therefore that Paul uses. He doesn't use un, he doesn't use gar in Greek. He uses this word ara, which is, is this kind of, a, like I was saying, a big climactic conclusion. Therefore, which causes many people to say, you can't just look back at what he just said, which is usual when you say the word therefore. We want to look at the verse before, the verses before. He said, no, you've got to look back at everything Paul has said up to this point. Everything Paul has said, from the, the truth of our condemnation to the truth of our justification. We've been talking about sanctification, the right now aspect of salvation. And he comes to, therefore, or all right then. <laughs> and in fact, the last thing he just said was chapter 7, verse 25. Well, let's back up to verse 24. He said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then you get to chapter 8. He says, therefore, since we have been delivered from the body of death by Jesus Christ, our Lord, since we are no longer under the law, since Jesus Christ has become the new Adam and done what the last or undone what the first Adam did, because Christ has given us free salvation, therefore, drum roll please, right? There is no condemnation. In fact, those words, there is, are not there. There's no verb in the Greek here. He says, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been using this judicial metaphor all the way through the book of Romans, haven't we? He's been using the, the terms like guilt and terms like justified. He's been using this legal metaphor where God is the judge and you are the one standing trial. But he talks about how God made a way for us to be justified apart from the law in Christ Jesus. So in chapter 8, verse 1, after all this legal and courtroom language and all of the explanations and all of the making sure you're not misunderstanding it in chapter 6 and 7, we get to chapter 8 where the gavel finally falls, not guilty. Isn't that wonderful? We got we to gotta get a little happy here, right? No condemnation. No guilt. There's nothing left. You've been waiting. You've been dreading to hear what is the Lord going to do. Satan comes in as the accuser, accusing you before the judge. Jesus comes in as your advocate, your defense attorney. He presents his own blood for what he has done. And then the Lord says, all right, no condemnation. And that word for condemnation is katakrima. This was a forensic word. This was used in courtrooms. And it means to be Condemned. It means a damnatory sentence. It can even mean sentence to death. It, it, if you want to break down the etymology, it means judgment against or even judgment down, as in judgment is going down today. But there's none of that for you and for me. We are guilty, but we've been justified. Now we can celebrate. And that's what chapter 8 is. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. We've already talked about in chapter 6 what it means to be in Christ. How do you get in Christ? Well, you repent. You turn from your old ways. You change your way of thinking and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You fall to your knees like the, the jailer in Philippi and you say, what must I do to be saved, right? And then you do what the Lord tells you. You believe and you walk in his righteousness. So if therefore you are in Christ, what is true of him is true of you. We talked about being crucified with Christ and being raised to walk with Christ. We're going to talk about being glorified with Christ. But the point today is, is Christ guilty? No. <laughs> That's an easy one, guys. No, he's not. Even Pontius Pilate, I find no fault with this man. Amen. And they condemned him anyway. In the same way, if you are in Christ, when you stand before the Lord, the Lord looks to you and says, I find no fault with this man or with this woman. 
Because of you? Because how great you are? No, because of how great Christ is. And I can see it. Sometimes this is hard to grasp and accept. You say, well, I know I've got faults. Not in Christ you don't. We already read in chapter 7. That's all part of the flesh. That's part of the body. The soul's been regenerated. So the Lord looks at you and he goes, no condemnation, no guilt, no fear because of what Jesus has done. Turn with me to John chapter 8, will you? You all know this story. And you might have thought I was going to go here. Well, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. John chapter 8. Here's a story talking about no condemnation. It says, early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Can you hear the sarcasm there? Jesus would often say, You have heard it is said, but I say unto you. Well, now they come and say, The law says to stone such women. What do you say? This they said to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, what does that mean? Like, oh, so you can't even give us the time of day? You're just going to sit there drawing in the dirt? Well, Jesus, his mama had told him, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all, right? <laughs> but as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who was without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Amen. That's no condemnation. Amen. That's, was she sinful? Yes. Are you sinful? Yes. Do you deserve death? Yes. Did she deserve death? Yes. But what did Jesus say? I don't condemn you. And in your heart, that fleshly, still kind of in love with the law part of you said, well, that's not right that he said that because she deserved to die. You have not yet understood the love and the grace of God if, if you're still thinking that. He said, I don't condemn you. I have not come to condemn the world, Jesus said, but to save the world. The only one who is able to judge you has decided not to condemn you. He has shown mercy. He has shown clemency. You will walk out of that courtroom free and clear and nobody can touch you or drag you back in. In fact, in Zechariah, God would get mad at Satan for trying to bring somebody back a second time. We've already determined to save this one. Get out of here. We've already given the verdict and it is no condemnation. You stand there and all of your sin and all of your mess and all of your past and all the things inside you that you're trying to keep under control but keep popping out and Satan says the law says that they must go to hell for the wages of sin is death. What do you say Lord? And the Lord says I do not condemn them. There's that song that we sing in Christ alone that has the words no guilt in life nor fear in death. That's what Christ has bought for us. No guilt in life. Man, guilt will wreck you. Isn't that true? Amen. If you grew up under a legalistic uh, church tradition or a family, then you know that guilt will just wreck you to pieces if you have nothing to, nowhere to go with it. If you have nowhere to go and receive forgiveness or receive hope, that, that guilt will just eat you alive. But Jesus comes in and says, I don't condemn you. And no fear in death, because why would we be afraid to die if we know that there's nothing that God can point out and say, well, that's still sinful. He's already determined not to condemn us. So if you say, well, God told me that he's angry and that I'm still going to hell. No, he didn't. Satan loves to masquerade as an angel of light. He comes in and tells you, this is the Holy Spirit talking. You're still condemned and you're going to hell. Oh, no, God spoke to me. And I know what God's voice sounds like. Oh, not if he's saying things like you're still condemned or that you're going to hell even though you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a liar. You reject that for the grace of God. That promise will clear away the whole clouds of your life. 
where you're no longer walking under darkness. You're walking in, the Bible says, marvelous light. It is more spiritual, Christian, to enjoy grace than to fret over your failures. We need to hear that. It is more spiritual to enjoy grace than to fret over your failures. You can look more spiritual by fretting over your failures. Who looked more spiritual in that story, Jesus or the Pharisees? The Pharisees did, because they're zealous for righteousness, just like David and Phineas and all those guys. And Jesus said, you're all full of sin, so nobody gets to cast a stone. Uh, sounds kind of liberal to me, Jesus. No way. That's grace. That is God's grace. Oh, you don't like the word liberal? We have been set free in Christ Jesus. That is related to the word for liberty and liberation. So, yes, you have been set free in Christ Jesus. It is not more spiritual to go, yeah, but sin is still a big problem. No, it's not. It's not anymore. Grace has said no condemnation in Christ Jesus for you. But like those Pharisees, many Christians will say things like, how can you say that? And it's easy to preach, to stand up and say, yeah, yeah, grace, but there's a lot of traction that preachers will get doing that. A lot of views on YouTube to be had doing that. Yeah, 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 grace, but you still are a sinner, my friend. So we better have a good reason for why we say there's no condemnation. So let's, let's move on to verse 2. He says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For, this is an explanatory word. So we have that, that profound announcement of no condemnation. And he explains that we are not condemned because we have a privileged status by the spirit in Christ. Because there's the law of the spirit of life, which has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, this is important. In verse two, he uses the word law twice. Now, most of the time, almost every time in the book of Romans, when he refers to the law, he's referring to the capital L law of Moses. But I think in these verses, he's not using the term law in that way. And I'm, I'm certainly not alone in thinking that. That the term law here, he's more talking like, like a scientific law or a spiritual, a principle. This is what he was saying back in verses 21 through 23. I, I find that there's a law in me. It's kind of a play on words, right? That when I want to do right, I do the wrong thing. He says, you want a law? There's a law for you. I can't stop sinning. So this is how he's using it here. Two different principles. If you try to attach them both to mean Moses' law, this interpretation gets a little clunky. So it's important to know that. These are not capital L laws in verse 2. But let's look at that second one first. The law of sin and death. That's from which we have been set free. Well, we've already seen this multiple times in Romans. What is the law of sin and death? Well, the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6.23, right? The payment you get for sin is death. The soul that sins shall surely die. That's Ezekiel says that. That's the law of sin and death. And every one of us has sinned. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, we are all subject to death because of sin. And that last chapter, chapter 7, gave an extended look at the hopelessness of sinful corruption. Chapter 7 is about walking in the flesh. What does it look like when you try to do God's rules on your own? It's a long, unbroken, miserable string of failure. I try to do the right thing. I can't even do the right thing, even though I want to do the right thing. So what's wrong with me? I'm wretched. I'm a wretched man. That's hopelessness. That's the law of sin and death. But to have no condemnation means, in verse 2, to be free from that law, the law that says the wages of sin is death and every one of us is a sinner. We've been set free from that. The chains have been broken. So how is that possible? If you're saying that I'm no longer under the penalty of sin and death, you better have a really good explanation for it. Well, he does. He says it is the law of the spirit of life. That's the other law, the other principle that has liberated us here. And Romans 8 is the Holy Spirit chapter of the book of Romans. Paul refers to the Holy Spirit more times in this chapter than in any other chapter he's ever written. He'll refer to the Spirit 19 times in Romans chapter 8, 15 times in just the first 17 verses, in the first half. And we're going to get more into detail next week about what it means to be full of the Spirit and so on. But right now we're just looking at this law of the spirit of life. And this is the exact opposite of the other one, which was sin and death. The Holy Spirit, 
The third person of the Trinity comes inside you, regenerates your heart, sanctifies you for salvation. He creates a new destiny for you that you're no longer headed for hell, now you're headed for heaven. But not only that, he changes your life right now. He makes everything better. He restores you and gives you a new direction in life. That when you put your faith in Christ, his Holy Spirit comes and dwells with you and begins to clean stuff up and regenerates your desires and rejuvenates your body even, it's going to say later in this chapter, that you can do the things that God has called you to do. And that it's the first down payment, the word will say, of the consummation of the kingdom that we're going to experience someday. We know that we're going to heaven because the Spirit is in us. That's the exact opposite of what the law of sin and death has done. The Holy Spirit brings life, but the law and sin only bring death. And Paul, of course, is drawing upon New Testament experience here, but he's also drawing upon what God promised to do in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, when the children of Israel were in exile in Babylon, the prophet said, or the Lord said through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And Paul is saying that time is now. When God said, I'm going to take away your hard heart and give you a new one and put my Holy Spirit within you to help you obey me, that, that day is right now. That's the law of spirit of life. Because before, your corrupted flesh could not do what God wanted it to do. So, Every time you looked into God's law, every time you looked at the Bible, every time you looked at the Ten Commandments, every time you looked at a good example, every time you thought about what you ought to be doing, it was full of guilt and sadness and anger because you just couldn't do it. Isn't that true? You got to know that that's true. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, I've never killed anybody, but Jesus said that if you have hatred in your heart or anger in your heart or if you insult your brother, you're guilty of the same thing. Well, now I'm really in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why many people who don't understand the grace of God get so angry with God and so angry with religion. And the sad thing is, many of the people that go out there blasting the church and blasting the gospel, although they're blaspheming and they're wrong, in many ways we agree with what they're saying. It's like, well, yes, if that was the gospel, I wouldn't like it much either. If you were just telling me, do the right thing and, and stop that and straighten up and do all these silly things, well, yeah, I wouldn't like that much either. But you've been set free from all that because now the Holy Spirit comes in and, and you've got all these laws that you can't keep. But the Holy Spirit comes in and he defibrillates your heart. He shocks it back. It's alive now. He makes alive in you what was dead. And the Bible says now you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside you. You are a walking, talking, holy place. Even though you're still walking in dead flesh, what's inside is alive. That's the law of spirit of life. Everything was dead because of sin, but then the Spirit comes inside you and brings it all back to life. He lights that fire again inside of you that was put out the second Adam sinned. That's the Spirit of life. That's the new law. It says, yeah, used to be that we were under this rule that said if you sin, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. It says, but now we're under a new rule, which is when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, everything changes. John especially loves to use these, these opposite descriptions from darkness to light from death to life right paul will say from the law to the spirit everything's changed because god has changed it so we can claim to have no condemnation how dare you how dare you walk around saying like paul did in romans 7 it is no longer i who sin but sin who dwells in me how can you say something like that we read some of these verses and we don't even like them Amen. it's like paul you can't say that Paul did say that, and God inspired the, Paul to write that down. How can you claim that? Because God has spoken a new law over you. And I think many times we are way too familiar with the law of sin and death and not familiar enough with the law of the spirit of life. That doesn't apply to me anymore. And even that, you go, oh, don't say that, Tyler. No, it doesn't apply to you anymore. You've been set free from it. The chains were broken. You're, you don't have to do that. You don't have to show up for duty for sin anymore. Do you remember that from Romans chapter 6? The Holy Spirit has given you life. He has given you life in the past. You were dead in your sins, but he has, like I said, defibrillated your heart. He's shocked you back into life by his mighty power. 
Number two, he's giving you life right now. That he's changing everything you do, those habits that wrecked your life, those, those attitudes that were so damaging to you. He's removing those one by one. He's helping you to walk in righteousness. He's bringing virtue into your life, not just vice. And sometimes he brings in virtue first before he removes those other things. But you've got to look to those for hope. But number three, he's going to give you life in the future. That he's going to bring you to the presence of the Lord. That he's going to present you to Christ as that pure, holy bride has given, is giving, and will give life to you. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You say, well, all right, but I, I don't know. You can say that. It's easy to say that you're saved. But what could possibly have made that possible? Is God a bad judge where he just lets serial killers go because he's trying to be nice and make friends with them? Well, no. You already know the answer to this, but Paul's going to hit it again in verse 3. For God, here's another explanatory word, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. All right. So Paul makes this profound announcement, which is based on our privileged status. How is that possible? By the perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered. We just described a major rule change, that you're no longer under the law of death, you're under the law of life. How is that possible? How could that possibly be done? I think you're just making stuff up. You want God to be happy with you, so you're just saying things. No, we're not. Because look at that, right in verse three, the first thing is that God has done. God has done this. Nothing to do with you or me. We've already seen, pretty well established in this book, you can't save yourself. You, you are not good enough on your own. You are not beautiful in your failures. You are going to hell. So the only person that could save you is God. But the good news is that God has done. And you've got to look to the end of that, that verse to see what he did. What did God do? He condemned sin in the flesh. Do you like that? He's saying there's no condemnation for you. There is condemnation for sin, though. Something that the law, and again in verse 3, now we're back to referring to the capital L law, the law of Moses could not do. So any, anybody who wants to get you back on the law of Moses, remember this verse, that there are things the law cannot do, but only God can do for you. God never intended the law to be the means of salvation. Never. It, was, it wasn't like, well, let's try the law, and if they can get it, then that'll be good enough. No, no, no. This is why the prophets would say things like, to obey is better than sacrifice. Why Isaiah would say things like, would you just stop sacrificing? God can't stand it anymore. How dare you? We're trying to keep the law. He goes, but you're not really keeping the law because your heart's rotten. And Abraham and Noah and others were saved before the law, so it's obviously not necessary to be saved. And Paul's made it very clear that nobody keeps the law. James would say the same thing. All the law could do was expose sin. If you could keep the law, great, but you can't. Thou shalt not covet. Got it. I'll never covet anything again. You drive down the road and you hear coming up next to you. And you look over and you go, oh, I want that. Oh, no, I did it. <laughs> but, Lord, that's not fair. No, it's, it's totally fair. You're broken. That's the problem. All the law could do was expose sin, which is why Galatians 3.21 says, is the law contrary to the promises of God? No. Right? The law is not your enemy. Sin is your enemy. Because he says in that verse, if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Paul says, if there was a standard that you could keep in order to be saved, that's how God would have done it. But there's not. Because you can't. Have we hit that enough? You can't keep the law. Someone says, well, I, we need to keep the law. You, you can't. You can't. Even after salvation, Peter told those that wanted to have the Gentiles circumcised and brought in. He says, we couldn't keep this. Our fathers couldn't keep this. You want to make them try to keep this? Sin abounded under the law. Because the commandment came in, it says, to increase the trespass. Because, you know, it's one thing if you're, if you're let's say, well, you're lusting, all right? You're lusting after a woman that's not your wife. That's bad. But then God comes in and says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And then you do it again anyway. Well, which one's worse? The one after God told you not to do it and you went and did it anyway. You do this with your kids, right? The first time they do something, you go, okay, look, 
don't do that again. That's not good. You shouldn't do that. Then the kid looks you dead in the eye and tries to put their finger in the electrical socket again, right? <laughs> My little boy's nine months old, Sammy. He can't talk, but kids are smarter than you think they are. If you've never had kids, you don't get this yet. They're plenty smart to sin and rebel when they're that young. Because he knows he's not supposed to be putting stuff in his mouth, right? Because he can't chew and he has no teeth, so he's going to choke on it. But the other day, he had, there was like a pen or a crayon or something on the, on the table, and he's kind of playing around. He reaches up and he grabs it, and then he looks at me. Because he knows he's not supposed to. And he slowly takes it, <laughs> opens his mouth, and he goes, I go, Sammy, no. And he drops it. Like, what? I wasn't doing anything. It's like nine months old, and he knows he's not supposed to do that. But he's doing it anyway. And that was a worse sin than the first time because I was staring him dead in the eyes like God is always looking at you. And he did it anyway. The law increases the trespass. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 9 says that the law was a ministry of condemnation. So we have no condemnation in Christ. But if you want to go back to the law, that's a ministry of condemnation. All it can do is bring about condemnation. It's also called the ministry of death in that chapter. So those that are fascinated with the law, you don't want to mess around with that because you can't keep it. So as we see in verse 3, God stepped in. God did it because what was the problem with the law? Not the law, me. I was the problem. This sinful flesh that was corrupted by sin can't do the right thing. Even if it wants to, it can't do the right thing. And the law can never fix that because the law is just a list of rules. So God did what the law could not do because the law was weakened by the flesh. So God says, I got to deal with this flesh. I got to deal with this sin. So God stepped in. He condemned sin in the flesh. The law was a ministry of condemnation for you, but God stepped in and said, I'm going to do something that will condemn your sin and provide no condemnation for you. Anybody getting excited about this? This is wonderful. God's trying to set some people free from this judgment and guilt that you've been carrying around. And it might be fearful to let go of it because you feel like you're somehow blaspheming God. You're not. Look at what the word says. How did God do this? Well, how could God remove that condemnation? He says it there by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. This is Christmas time. We're celebrating this. We're remembering this. The birth of Jesus was the signal of the beginning of what God was going to do to condemn the flesh. And there's so much packed into that little phrase, but I want to go through this very quickly. There's five things that this verse about the incarnation, the infleshment of Jesus, confirms for us. And I want to make sure we hit them very quickly. So number one about the incarnation from this passage says that Christ was sent. In order for Christ to be sent, he had to exist beforehand. So this is important, that Christ was pre-existent. And this is used as one of the passages to confirm that. Many people will say, yeah, Jesus was born, and, and then God gave him the Spirit, and then he made him God at the end. No. John 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So, was and with. If you don't believe in the Trinity, you have a real hard time with that verse. But Christ existed beforehand. So, this was before any of this happened. There was Jesus with the Lord. Second, we see that Christ is distinct from and submissive to his Father in triune harmony. So, right, he says the Father sent his Son. So, the Son is not the Father. And yet we know that Jesus would say that I and the Father are one. So, there's a great beautiful picture of the threeness of the Trinity here. That Christ submitted to his father. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. Not my will, but yours be done. They are three persons, although they are one. Their personality is distinct from one another. This is important to see. Because people will tell you things like, well, the Trinity wasn't developed until hundreds of years later, and the apostles never believed it. Well, they didn't use the word Trinity, but they sort of walked and talked and wrote like they did, right? Number three, we say that he took on flesh which means he was fully man, the humanity of Christ, that he was able to bear our sin, that he was there in the beginning, he was distinct from the Father, and when he came, he took on humanity in that profound hypostatic union between God and man. Any doctrine that minimizes the humanity of Christ needs to be avoided or reevaluated. He was 100% man. 
Second John 7 says that the doctrine of the Antichrist is that Jesus has not come in the flesh. Isn't that remarkable to consider? Oh yeah, Jesus was great, but you know, he, he wasn't all that the word says he is. He became a man. He was a little baby boy. He wasn't sitting there, you know, spouting off the, the profundities of the universe from his cradle. He was a baby. He grew, the Bible says he grew in knowledge and in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Like, that's kind of hard to wrap my head around. Yeah, it's the most profound mystery of all time. So don't worry if you kind of have a hard time with it. Number four, we see that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, is that, say, is that word likeness is homoioma. It's the sameness of sinful flesh. But why does Paul use a word like that? Well, because number four, his divinity. He came as a man but in the likeness of sinful flesh. What does that mean? It means that Jesus' soul was in a, a body that was as if it, it was sinful, though he himself was not. There's a really interesting implication there that if somebody never sinned, does that mean that their body would never wear out? But we're not going to touch that today. This, this is what we see in Philippians 2, verse 7, that he who was in the form of God took on the form of a servant. It's the word morphe. What that means is whatever Jesus had as God, he took on as man but he retained that divinity, okay? So he was in sinful flesh, but he himself was not a sinner. The Bible says that over and over again, right? He became sin who knew no sin, right? That we might become the righteousness of God. He was shared with us in all of our struggles, except that he did not sin, Hebrews said. And number five, so, so far he existed in the beginning, but was distinct from his father, took on humanity, but retained his divinity. And number five, it was his condemnation and suffering in the flesh that won our freedom. The passion of Christ. That doesn't mean passion like zeal. That means passion like suffering. The suffering of Christ. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. Hebrews ten nineteen says that he provided that perfect sacrifice once and for all. Suffering in the flesh. This was the plan. This was the incarnation. This is what Philippians 2 calls the kenosis, the emptying of Christ. Right? Did he empty himself of divinity and stop being God? No, but he set aside all of his privileges as God. Jesus was omnipresent, but while he was walking in the flesh, he didn't walk at 10 places at once. He humbled himself and walked in one place like we do. Right? That's humbling himself. And he became our perfect sacrifice, it says in verse 3, for sin. For sin. Peri hamartias. That phrase is interesting because it's used in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the, called the Septuagint. This phrase is used frequently to describe a sin offering, that you offer something peri hamartias, for sin. And one of the coolest places that... that uses that reference, is Isaiah chapter 53. Will you turn there with me real quick? You all know this passage. Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12. This, is, this is, ties right in with what Paul was saying. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, there it is, an offering for sin, peri hamartias, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. That's a prophecy of the resurrection. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Paul knew his Bible. He knew how to put in a good callback. Jesus Christ was sent and willingly sacrificed by his Father for sin. He took in his flesh all the judgment that your flesh deserved. We've already seen in the last chapter that sin resides in that flesh, and that he took that on the, on the cross that as they beat him and put the crown of thorns on him and pulled out his beard and mocked him, that was everything that your sin deserved. But he took it for you. And when you put your faith in Christ, everything that happened to him on the cross is applied to you. That's why there's no condemnation. Because Christ has made atonement for the flesh and sent his spirit to apply that to your heart. And when he does, your spirit comes alive. 
And even though your flesh is still sinful, it's going to die one day and be resurrected just like Jesus' was. But God doesn't make you wait for that. He gives you what we call the foretaste of glory divine, right? Right now. Jesus rose from the dead, confirming everything he ever said and did. He propitiated the wrath of God, meaning what, what justice required, Jesus fulfilled. So now those who are in Christ are indwelt by the Spirit. Their soul has been regenerated. The sin in their flesh has been paid for. So there's no condemnation left for you. Amen. How much condemnation is Jesus under? None. But he bore all of it at the cross. So now you don't have to bear any of it. That's the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Something to celebrate that there was a perfect sacrifice. Well, I know what my sin deserves. I can't walk in. But Jesus took all of that. Why are you still carrying some of that? Put it on him. Put it on the cross and walk as if you had none of it. Because you don't. And we see in verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So what was the purpose of Christ's death? It is a pure life lived by the Spirit. He says the law needed to be fulfilled, so let's be careful. Are we going right back to the law here? Oh, good, because people will say, yeah, Paul says all those things about the law in chapter 7, but then in verse 8 he brings us right back, and you need to keep the law after all. Well, I don't think so. Look at this closely. The righteous requirement, singular, of the law. We're not talking about the individual commandments of the law here. We're talking about the purpose of the law. What was it for? The, the telos, you might say, of the law. What was the goal? What was God trying to accomplish through the law? That's what has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And you also should see there, by the way, it doesn't say that we fulfill the law. It says that the law has been fulfilled in us. It's passive. So don't take this verse and twist it around to say, yeah, you're under grace, but you still got to keep the law. No, 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 no. God accomplishes it, and he accomplishes the purpose of the law, not the individual commandments. Because the law could not create righteous people. You can hold up the standard all you want and say, do this, but nobody can. Well, the standard is good, but if nobody can keep it, it's not doing us any good. But God can create righteous people. So he said, first thing I got to do is I'm going to pay the penalty of their sin. Then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to regenerate their soul. Now their soul is alive so they can master their bodies. And someday when they finally die, I'm going to resurrect that body and they're going to be totally transformed. Why Romans 7, 6 said, we are released from the law. Is that clear enough for you? We are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What is the morality and the ethic and the life of a Christian? Not a written code, but the active, dynamic, living presence of Holy Spirit inside you right now. That's new covenant language. I'll put my spirit in you and he will cause you to walk in righteousness. Jeremiah 31, the other new covenant passage from the Old, Old Testament said, I'm going to make a new covenant. Not like the old one where you had to keep all those rules. He says in Jeremiah 31, 33, I'll put my law within you. And I will remember your sin no more, he said in verse 34. Well, that's still to come. We're still waiting for the kingdom. Yeah, but the kingdom has been inaugurated in advance by the Holy Spirit. This is what we sometimes call the now and not yet. We're waiting for the kingdom to come. We're waiting for Jesus to come and set up that kingdom. But in the meantime, there's a lot of folks that need to be saved before Jesus comes and judges the world. But he said, but I'm not going to make my people wait on all those blessings. I'm going to give them to them right now so that they can walk in that. And Paul says, if you walk in obedience to the Spirit, you are not under the written code. Now, us good, well-meaning, you know, strong conscience people say things like, well, wait a minute. You can't just say there's no more rules because then people will sin. Well, first of all, Paul's already addressed that. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, right? But here's the thing. If you walk in obedience to the Spirit of God, you're not going to break any of the laws. You're not going to. We say, well, wait a minute, but Paul told, or God told Peter he could eat whatever food he wanted. Doesn't that break the law? That's the written code, my friend. What God is saying, I'm going to have you fulfill every purpose and every divine, holy, godly principle that the law was expressing. You don't have to keep that. You'll never, you'll never transgress if you walk with me. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You know these verses. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why does he throw that little phrase in at the end? Because he says, if you walk in the Spirit, here's all the things that are going to be true of you. And none of that breaks the law. So quit worrying about the law. As both Jesus and the Old Testament emphasize, it's the heart that matters, not the commandment itself. Jesus was the one walking around, raising up people on the Sabbath day, touching lepers, violating the cleanliness laws. You can't do that, Jesus. He goes, isn't love more important? The Bible says in the New Testament that love fulfills the law. So if you don't walk according to the flesh, and as long as you are alive, that is still a temptation to walk after your flesh. But if you don't, you don't need to worry about keeping any written code because the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you in violation of anything righteous. And you will do more than the law could ever accomplish anyway. Jesus did not slacken the Old Testament. He intensified it. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you that if you look at a woman with lust, you've done the same thing. So walking in obedience to the Spirit actually gives you a better morality and a better righteousness than keeping the Old Testament law ever could. Your whole life is changed. For, changed. It's transformed to one of godly obedience. So what does this mean? Let's back up and look at this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because you're no longer under the law of sin and death, but the Holy Spirit has given life to you. How is that possible? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And now you walk in obedience what the law could never accomplish. So what does this mean, Christian? God approves of you. When you walk in the Spirit, God looks at you and says, I like that. I love that. I'm for you. I'm on your team. Well, I still sin. Yeah, but the Bible calls your sin symptoms of a sick flesh. Yeah, I know you still sin because you're still stuck in that mud that I made. But don't worry, I'm going to glorify it one day and you'll never have to worry about it anymore. Why do we look at our sin as a greater evidence of our being lost than our righteousness as an evidence that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and has regenerated us? I don't know if I'm saved. Well, what are you worried about that for? Unsaved people don't worry about that. (laughs) Blasphemous, evil, wicked people don't walk around going, I don't know if I'm saved. I I went forward for five altar calls and I don't know if any of them took. That's not what, what... righteous or sinful people worry about there is no condemnation how much condemnation none now or ever well someday the lord will set it not what is verse one there is therefore now no condemnation you are no longer under the guilt of your sin lord setting some people free i can see that already if you're still feeling convicted condemned stop Stop. Well, I don't want to quench the Spirit. The Spirit has said there is no condemnation. So if you're feeling condemned, that's not God talking to you. It might be your mom's, mom's words in your head. It might be your dad's. It might be some guy you found online that speaks really charismatically. He makes you feel bad about yourself. It might be some weird legalistic tradition you grew up in. It might be your arrogance and pride that somehow thinks you need to accept something tougher than just the grace of God. The Bible calls that the stumbling block of grace. It's so easy that smart people go, well, it can't just be that. That's why the Bible says not many wise, not many rich, not many powerful. Because I think quite a lot of my own abilities, actually. So if anybody can get in there, well, that's, that's, that's probably not for me. Now, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Psalm 32 says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Is there any other joy like knowing that God loves you and accepts you and does not hold your sin against you? Don't ever let go of that. And don't come at me and say things like, well, there are some people that abuse the grace of God and they they act like they're saved even though they still sin. Well, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. Have you received the grace of God for your life? Are you demonstrating it for your children? Are you showing your coworkers and neighbors what true liberty in Christ looks like? Or are you making it all about the rules like we're a bunch of Pharisees? Legalism is always trying to sneak in. 
But in Christ, number one, you have a higher standard than the law, right? Well, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, Jesus said. But you also have a better way of life. That is not about keeping rules. It's about following Jesus and knowing God. Jesus said, I have come that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what makes the difference. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. And this is the commandment that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you were able to see the Trinitarian nature of this passage. The Spirit does this. Jesus does this. God the Father does this. I love that language. God the Father sent His Son Jesus to die, who took on flesh and bore our sins, and then sent the Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts and free us from sin and lead us day by day. God, from start to finish in your life. God has done. It is God has done this. So, Remember that. Does your salvation depend on you? No, it depends on the triune God that spoke the world into existence. I, I like those chances. If it depends on me, we're in big trouble. Depends on God, we're doing just fine. If you rest in his work, your life will be full of joy and peace and love. And you won't spend all your time fretting over your sin. You'll spend all your time saying, wow, sin in my life. That means there's more grace. See, even right there, we go, oh, I don't know about that. That's what Paul said. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Amen. Look at all this grace in my life. Instead of, look at all this sin in my life. It's like, wow, but I know God has saved me. That must make God that much more wonderful and loving and compassionate. God, I praise your name. But if you let yourself look at you, Satan will get you. He will afflict you with condemnation and despair. And you'll spend your whole life shuffling around, hoping God doesn't take a look at you. You'll never enter into the joy of the Lord. You'll never walk in the promised land. You'll spend your whole life wandering in the wilderness. But if you let yourself look to Jesus, you can realize you live in the days that were prophesied of old. The prophet said one day, God's going to send his Holy Spirit and we're not going to have to keep those written codes anymore. It's just going to come out of us because the Holy Spirit will be in us. Oh, Lord, I wish I could live to see that day. You get to live in that day. You're living in the someday of somebody else. So live it up. How, what would you think Ezekiel would, would say if he, if he found out all the people living in the days you prophesied about, when they'd get a new heart and not an old heart and the new covenant, they walk around feeling condemned and ashamed and, and thinking they probably ought to go back to the law. He'd be like, what? <laughs> Are they crazy? Don't they know what God has done? Don't they know how miserable this is waiting for the Messiah instead of looking back and celebrating what he's done? Christian, there is no condemnation for you. So walk in the joy of somebody that just found out they're not going to jail after all. Amen. Turns out my chains have been broken. Turns out I've been set free. I was in darkness, but now I'm I can see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. I'm no longer this, this den of evil. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's built with flesh, but God's going to deal with that someday. And I know that's true because Jesus Christ himself has risen from the dead to the glory of God the Father. 